Well, good morning, Rosebank Union Church. I am so glad that today I get to bring you God's word again. For those of you who might not know me, my name is Brett France. I'm on staff here and I love working for the church. Um, and so if you catched our sermon last week, uh, well, my sermon last week, you will know that we are kind of straddling. I get to straddle the new year. So I finished off 2020 and I get to look, uh, do the first sermon of 2021, which is an absolute privilege. It's also my first time preaching live. I've been so used to the pre-service lobby, if you join in early, and uh, kind of shooting the breeze online. Um, I'm not used to bringing God's Word live, but it, it, it's so exciting. And I just want to thank you again, church, for allowing us and giving us the resources to be able to broadcast church like this. So thank you so very much. Now, what I'm going to do for us is... We're going to get into the Word, and I'm going to recap a whole lot of um, a little bit of where we were last week. Like I said, we're in a, bit, uh, a mini-series. And so last week, we looked at Daniel chapter 7, and it was verses 1 through 12. Um, and what I wanted to remind us last week was that uh, God is in control. That's what I, the, the big idea that I took away from last week. God is in control. When it may seem like the world is falling apart around us, when it seems like there's just nothing we can do but cry out, who do we cry out to? The Ancient of Days, God, who is in control. And so that's what I took, what I wanted us to take away from last week. Uh, if you did miss last week, maybe you, you might be a bit lost. Don't worry, you can catch it on our YouTube channel, so you can always catch up. Uh, but I want to encourage you to do that later. Join us here today. Be present with us today. And so what I'm going to do first is do a very quick recap um, of uh, last week. I'm not going to re-preach the sermon. Don't worry. A very quick summary recap uh, because it's so important for us to know the background to the two verses that we're going to be looking at today. And we're going to get to that in a bit. So here's the recap. Daniel has this epic and terrifying vision, which is a dream. It happens at night and he writes it down. Um, he calls it a dream. I said last week, I think it's more of a nightmare. It was quite terrifying. And so what this dream is, I want to picture this with me. There's an, an untamed ocean. Uh, there's winds and it's dark and cloudy and it's terrifying. Not your picture perfect beach day. Uh, not that many of us know what that's like this year. Um, and so there's this terrifying ocean and out of this ocean four beasts come out of it and these four beasts represent the four kingdoms um, or four ancient powers of the earth so first what rises up is the babylonian empire that's the first beast the second beast comes after that and uh, that is the medo-persian empire the third beast comes up and that's represented as the greek empire and then the last final beast before this all the beasts were, rep uh, were shown as animals but this last beast is actually so terrifying that it can't be likened to an animal uh, we just hear that it's got these iron teeth and it destroys everything before it. And this last and final beast is so terrifying that Daniel just says, ah, it wasn't like an animal, it was just terrifying. And so this beast seems to be in control. It's more powerful than all the beasts before it. It's got 10 horns and one of the horns springs up. It destroys three of the horns before it, but it, it, it's like a human. It can speak and it's got these eyes. It's just a terrifying vision. And all this seemed lost. This beast has just taken over the world. But, but God, I love it when our Bible has a but in it, but God, the ancient of days sitting on his throne of fire with a, uh, with a river of fire coming up before him, the ancient of days judges the beast. He judges this most terrifying beast in one swift and easy movement. That beast is thrown into the ocean, destroyed, and the three beasts before it get judged as well. And so apocalyptic literature, that's what Daniel was using to write here. It's a lot of imagery and we're meant to feel it, not just understand it. And I hope that you feel right now the images that Daniel wrote. I want to encourage you, give it a read. Daniel chapter 7 verses 1 through 12. And so that's where we land today. We land where the ancient of days has just judged the, the beasts and we are led to see that God is in control. When everything around us may be falling apart, we can put our hope in the ancient of days, God, the almighty father who has control and wants to bring justice and does bring justice. He has the power to do it and he loves to do it to all the world. And so that's where we land today. And that's where we're going to pick up. We're going to read verses 13 to 14. So if you've got your Bibles open, why don't you turn there with me? Uh, the screen, it will be on the screen as well. So let's read together. Daniel chapter seven, verse 13. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming on the clouds, coming on the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. 
He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Ah, oh, God. <laughs> Your word is so good. I'm just going to pray for us really quickly as I've opened God's word here. Father, we ask you to reveal your word to us, to reveal yourself through your word. We ask you, please, Jesus Christ, make yourself known to us today as we explore your wonderful text, as we explore this ancient text that Daniel wrote down through a dream. We thank you so much that we get to do this today. Praise in your name, Lord. Amen. All right, so we're going to unpack the text. So the first thing I want us to look at is in my vision at night, the very first phrase that Daniel uses. So what I want to bring, draw us to here is that he is reminding us that this is a vision. He's reminding us that he isn't watching this happen in, in a live stream. Uh, he's watching it. He's seeing it happen in a dream and he's writing it down. And this is so important because I want to try to get us into Daniel's life in what he was seeing here. I want to draw us into um, like Daniel's understanding of what this all means for him. And so... Daniel, his whole life, has worshipped God, Yahweh, the Almighty One. In, 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 in Daniel's understanding of God, Yahweh, God the Most Powerful, the Ancient of Days, who, we've, who we read about in verses 1 through 12, is one single being. Yes, God's being has many facets to it. He is omnipresent and uh, he can be anywhere and everywhere at the same time. He dispenses his, his own spirit separate to himself. He has the Word of God, which is separate to himself, which is the Tanakh. But God is one being. I want you to hold that in your mind. In fact, God, um, not God, Daniel would even hold this verse in mind in Exodus 34, where God is speaking with Moses. See, he would look to, in, in this text, he would hold in, in his heart Exodus 34. And he would, being a good uh, young Bible scholar, he would know that what was happening is Moses was speaking to God and he said, Moses said to God, reveal yourself to me, God. I want to see your glory. And so uh, in response, this is what God says in Exodus 34. But God said to Moses, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. You cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. Moses asked God to show him his glory, and he said, no, if I show you my glory, if I show you my face, you will die. If you come into my presence, you will die. And so Daniel knows that no man can see God and live. No one could walk into the presence of God and stay alive. So I want you to do is hold on to that for me. Hold on to um, that, and let's go back to verse 13. So what it says, One like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. So in Daniel's, in Daniel's mind, God is one, one being, and no person can go into the presence of God. And yet in his dream, he sees someone like a son of man entering into the presence of God. I, I would have loved to have been in Daniel's mind and almost have him write his feelings here and being like, What? What is happening? How can a man go into the presence of God? And Moses asked if he could do that, and God told him he would die if he went into the presence. So who on earth is the son of man? And so it's important for us to understand what is, uh, how Daniel is, is describing this to us. He says, like a son of man. So he doesn't say a human. He says, like a human. Um, and again, it's also important for us to remember what, how the, the original text that is written here. So I mentioned it last week, but Daniel chapter 1 through 7 is written in Aramaic, which is a sister language to Hebrew. And so the word that Daniel would have used here to say like a son of man is bar anash, enash, bar anash, which is the Hebrew, I mean, the Aramaic word for human being. Uh, when, if you were to translate this into Hebrew, uh, the word would be ben adam, son of Adam. Again, simply meaning human being. And so Daniel's trying to tell us that uh, someone who looked like a man, but he couldn't be a man because he went into the presence of God. That, that, that is what I am seeing happen right now. Hold on to that for us. It gets even crazier than that. It gets even crazier than this man, someone like a man, being in the presence of God because God gives him something. So read with me here. In verse 14, he says, His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. That's the second half of verse 14. I want to read the first half of verse 14 for us. He says, 
the Son of Man, he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, the second half of verse 14, that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So not only has Daniel seen someone step into the presence of Yahweh, but God, the Ancient of Days, who has dominion and sovereignty over everything, gives the Son of Man the power over the world. I wish I could have seen Daniel's emotions and, and heard his thoughts when he was watching this. He must have been so confused. Imagine being Daniel your whole life and having an understanding of God almost shattered in this vision that you see. Imagine, imagine with me this, that a being that is like a human being just entered into the very presence of Yahweh and he did not die. And not only did he not die, but he was given authority, glory and power over the world. The son of man is exalted to the king of the world. Our Bibles are so rich and I really hope, church family, that in the time of lockdown, you've maybe had a chance to dig into God's word a bit more. I've so enjoyed getting into the Old Testament here. Uh, so just, um, man, I love the word of God. I really pray, church, that you've enjoyed it too. So I guess the next question then is, well, who is the son of man? Who on earth is this person who is like a person, but yet in the presence of God? Well, I think I gave it away a little bit earlier. The Son of Man is Jesus. Obviously, obviously it's Jesus. Now, how, how do we know this? How do we know that the Son of Man is Jesus? And it's a good question. And believe it or not, scholars have argued for millennia over who this, um, who this Son of Man could be. So why do we say, why do we say that it is Jesus? Um, what evidence do we have for this? Now, the good old classic Sunday school answer will, suffi will suffice here. And that answer is because Jesus said so. When we read the gospel accounts, we see that Jesus used the term son of man to reference to himself 81 times, 81 times. It was his favorite term to say who he was. Throughout the four gospel accounts, the synoptic, that's Matthew, Mark and Luke, and in the gospel of John, the four gospel accounts, Jesus uses this phrase throughout to call himself the son of man. And so I, I would love to read every single eight, every one of those 81 verses with you. Um, but I think you may cut the stream before I get done. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight my favorite one, my favorite son of man, where Jesus calls himself the son of man. Um, we're going to highlight that for you. So my favorite son of man verse in the New Testament, obviously the favorite one right now is from uh, Daniel. It also appears in Psalms and Ezekiel and a few other places. But here, Daniel chapter 7 is my favorite Old Testament. But my favorite New Testament son of man verse is uh, in the, it's Mark chapter 14, verses 60 to 64. And the same exact, exact account can be found in Matthew uh, chapter 26, verse 63. But we're going to use the Mark accounts from verse 14. Now, before we get into it, before we read it together, uh, what I want to point out where I want to give you a little bit of the backstory to this verse. Again, everything I'm going to tell you is in your Bible, so you can turn there and uh, read it for yourself. But I'll give you the summary version. So picture this with me. Jesus has just been arrested by the Jewish leaders of, um, of Judaism. And uh, they've arrested him because they want to put him to death. And try as they might, they have tried so hard for so many months to catch him out. You'll remember throughout the gospel accounts, the Pharisees ask him tricky questions to try to catch him out, to hear him say something wrong, but they can't catch him out. And so eventually he's betrayed by Judas uh, in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's taken now to, the, um, to a, a courtroom where the Sanhedrin are going to judge him. And now we need to understand a little bit about the, the Jewish um, hierarchy and how, they, how it worked in their religion. And so the Sanhedrin were the leaders of the Pharisees. They were almost like the elders or the elder governing body of the Pharisees. And now within that, there was one leader. There was a person who led uh, the Sanhedrin. So he was the senior pastor, if you will, or he was, he was the person in charge. And he was known as the high priest. Now, the high priest was a beautiful, um, 
a role. It was an honor to be that. You were the only person who was allowed into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, the one time in, a, in the year where you could go into where God's presence dwelt in the Holy of Holies. You were the only person who was allowed to do that. So the high priest was just the leader of the Jewish religion uh, and it was a beautiful role to have. And so in this setting, Jesus is in the courtroom. Guys, this could be TV. They, they could make a series out of this. Jesus is in the courtroom and the Sanhedrin have organized all these false um, people to come and give false witness about Jesus. But the thing is, their, their court case falls apart because the different witnesses are saying different things. The stories don't match up. And so it can't work. They can't put, find a reason to put Jesus to death. And so almost in a last ditch attempt, uh, attempt the, the um, high priest turns to Jesus in the courtroom and says, what do you say to all that has been said here? What do you say? It's a desperate attempt to try and catch Jesus out one last time. And so that's where we jump into our text. So it's going to be on the screen. If you've got your Bibles with me, tap or turn there. But it's Mark, like I said, chapter 14, reading from verse 63. Let me find my place here. Here you go. Again, the high priest asked him, that's Jesus, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Do you see it, church? I'm going to read a part of that again. I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus has taken from our text, from Daniel chapter 7, He's taken that and likened it to Himself. He's taken the exact same imagery. Have a look. It will be on your screen with me. Son of Man. Jesus said it. Daniel wrote it there. Daniel wrote that the Son of Man will come on, a cloud, on clouds of heaven. Jesus says, you will see me. Son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. And we see the ancient of days sitting on his throne and Jesus going into his presence in, in uh, or the son of man going to his presence. Here in the verse, we see Jesus saying, I will be beside the blessed one. That's God, the ancient of days. Both of these terms are for Yahweh. And Jesus has taken this exact imagery out of Daniel chapter 7 and applied it to himself in this trial in the Sanhedrin. And church, do you want to know why? Do you want to know why this is my favorite son of man verse? It is because Jesus, before Jesus says, I am, before he says, I am again, which is a loaded statement. And I even want to just draw your attention very quickly to um, that Jesus said that he, Jesus remained silent at the start of that verse and gave no answer, which is from Isaiah 53, 7, that he was silent as he was led to the slaughter. Uh, there's just so, oh guys, please read your Bible. There's just so much in here. And again, the, the I am statement, it's a loaded statement. Um, Jesus is essentially saying, I am God. Because goes, this goes back to when Moses, God revealed himself to Moses in the burning bush. Anyway, I'm going to get back to our text. Why is this my favorite uh, son of man verse? Because before Jesus said, I am, the Sanhedrin could not find a reason to kill him. The Sanhedrin had nothing against Jesus. They could not put him to death. They could, not, this, uh, they could not bring their conspiracy about. And why is, why is that so important? Because it's only after Jesus says this do they condemn him to death. I'm just going to read the back end of that verse again. The high priest tore his clothes. He says, why do we need any, any more witnesses? He asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Because Jesus said this, the Sanhedrin could condemn him to death. Now, this reminds me of another great verse. It's what Jesus says in John chapter 10. And these are the words of Jesus. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to bring it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay down it, I lay down it of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father Jesus laid down his, this command I received from my father. And so what I love is that Jesus laid down his own life by quoting Daniel chapter, verse, chapter 7, verse 13. Jesus gave up his life by quoting this verse. He said, I am the Messiah. I am God. And with these words, he sealed his fate to death. And not just any death, but death 
on a cross. The most significant death in all the world. And why might you ask, is this death so significant? Well, that is answered in verse 14 of Daniel chapter 7. So read with me. This is what he says. This is what the verse says. Daniel writes, He, the Son of Man, was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So remember those four kingdoms that we read about in the first 12 verses of this? Well, Jesus' death ushered in a fifth kingdom. But this kingdom was unlike any before it. In fact, uh, in your, if you have a look in your Bible, it's probably um, entitled at the start of Daniel chapter 7, Daniel's dream of four beasts. And again, those four beasts represent four kingdoms. Some Bibles will call it, uh, will say Daniel's dream of four kingdoms or four empires rather. And I, if I were to title this whole section, I would almost call it Daniel's dream of five kingdoms, four beasts, one son of man. Because the death of Jesus ushered in a fifth kingdom that will last forever. A kingdom of all tribes, nations, and tongues. And to institute this kingdom, Jesus needed to die. He needed to die so that on the third day, he could rise up from the dead and have ultimate victory be won. You see, our sin was dealt with when Jesus died. But death was defeated forever when he rose from the grave. The defeat of death, and because of the defeat of death, an everlasting kingdom could be instituted. Before this, it was almost impossible to live a righteous and perfect life. In fact, it was impossible. But Jesus, carrying the sin of the world on that cross, paid our debt. And by rising from the dead, because our debt was paid, we could now rise from the dead and enter into an eternal kingdom, which Jesus came to bring down. Now, church, this message brings hope into a world that is in, a, in desperate need of it. If there was a year that needed hope, I think it's the year 2021 because we know what 2020 was like. And I've heard it said that 2021 isn't going to be too different from 2020. Yes, we have vaccines being rolled out, um, but it's going to take time. We currently have started the year in a lockdown. I wasn't expecting that at all. And yet here we stand, level three lockdown. For something, I think the last time we were there was July or August. I thought that was behind us, but no, here it is, the start of 2020 in lockdown, unable to go to the beaches, unable to go to um, restaurants past eight o'clock or whatever the curfew is. We need hope, church, because we are in for another difficult year. I really do believe that. Outside of COVID even, our hope is that we grow as a society. Each year will be better than the last. That's our hope. And that's often why there's so much hope put into a new year. That's why New Year's Eve is such a big thing because we hope that all the, all the sorrow and the pain is gone and finished and hopefully this new year will bring something better. And as a, as a society, we do get better each year. We hope for an end to, to gender-based violence. We hope to the end of racial discrimination, the end of war, murder, suffering, famine. We hope for those things and we must work towards the end of those things. And each year as a society, we grow safer. But church, the sad reality is that this side of eternity, we will never attain, attain all of that to be done, clean, and finished. While we might advance as a society each year, the fact remains that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Humans are, well, human, and they cannot be perfect. We cannot put our hope in humans or in humanity. We cannot put our hope in a new year. You can't put your hope in a new you. For new Year's Eve was just a Thursday night. New Year's Day was just a Friday, just another day in the week. There's no magic power attached to a new year. A new year doesn't wipe the slate clean. It can't do that. But you know what? There is one. There is one who wipes the slate clean for all eternity. And his name is Jesus, the Son of Man. God took on flesh in the person of Jesus and came down to earth. The Son of Man came down to earth and lived a faultless life so that he could offer this faultless life up as the perfect sacrifice for all humanity. And in doing so, Jesus bore the sin of each individual. That's you and me. 
and he paid the price for our sin. And then not only did he pay the price by dying on a cross, he defeated death and was raised up on the third day. Defeating death forever. All of this was done so that whoever trusts in Jesus will have eternal life. By defeating death, Jesus ushered in the final and greatest kingdom ever, his kingdom. And anyone who believes in Jesus is a part of that kingdom. Their sin is forgiven. Their death is just a transition into eternity. If you follow Jesus, you can have hope in something greater than the new year someone greater than yourself, someone greater than anyone or anything you could ever possibly hope for. You can have hope in the King of Kings, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. That is why Jesus came to institute his kingdom, for you and for me, to end suffering, brokenness and pain, a world we all long for, a world we hope for at the start of each new year, a world we cannot attain except for Jesus Christ. That is why he allowed himself to be killed, because he has a greater love for you and for me than even his own life. Jesus the Christ puts his life ahead of yours. That is crazy. The very one who can enter into the presence of God and live, the very one who is God, gave up his life for you. He wants to know you. Do you know him? Do you know that the Son of Man came down from heaven and slayed the ultimate beast of sin for you and for me? All you need to do is is believe in Him. And so at the cusp of the new year, as we look into 2021 and hope for something new, I want to ask you this question. What are you hoping for? Or rather, better yet, who are you hoping in? What have you put your hope in? Is it a new year? A new you? A clean slate? Or is your hope in Jesus, the Son of Man? Now, if you're not sure how to answer this question, I want to invite you to do this. Investigate the person of Jesus and his claims. You see, I once stood on the outside of Christianity. I stood on the outside of this thing that I'm now so a part of. And I looked in and I thought, shame. (laughs) I don't know if these oaks get it. It's just one big fairy tale. It's made up. How on earth could you believe this? I used to pity Christians. I stood on the outside, I looked in and I thought, "Mm mm-mm. Then one day I was challenged by a friend to just simply investigate. It was simply this, if it's all wrong, if you are right, Brett, if, if uh, if it's all a lie, if nothing, if it is a fairy tale, you've got nothing to lose. It's maybe three months of your life just investigating this thing. But, but if it is real, Oh, you've got everything to lose. So just give it a try. So I thought, right, I'm cleverer than all those Christian people. I'll give it a bash. So I attended church for a few months. I did my own research. I dug into stuff. I asked all the questions. I stayed constantly cynical, constantly judgmental. But the thing is, the more and more investigated, the more and more confused I got. See, I had questions like this. Can you trust the Bible? How do I know that everything that's written in here can be trusted? Why is it, another question that I I had, why is it that Christians give Christianity such a bad name? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? I mean, that sounds crazy. So many questions. But you see, like I said, I got confused. The more and more I read, the more and more there were answers to my questions. And not only did I start to understand it up here, it started to sink into here. There was a space inside of me that needed filling and all of a sudden it was being filled. And I got to the point where I needed to either just make the decision that I was choosing to not believe in this thing. I was choosing, I was choosing that, I don't know, look, they probably have something going on there. I don't want part of it. Or I needed to decide and trust and believe inside of me what I knew to be true, that they were onto something. And so I stuck around, I kept going to church and slowly and slowly I grew in my understanding of God. God revealed himself to me and Jesus, the son of man, made himself known to me. And one of my favorite verses that helps me understand this is from Romans 8. Because while I was still a sinner, Christ died for me. And I'm going to read that verse for us. Paul writes this. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. 
Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God, whenever you see a but God, stand up and listen. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I love the fact that while I was still a sinner, while I was still questioning, Christ had already done everything I needed there and then for me. All I had to do was put my trust in him. And so if you are unsure of where you stand with God, I want to invite you, reach out to us. If you are unsure about any of this, if there's something tweaking in your heart and you think, I don't know, I I have questions too, I want them answered, reach out to us. Social media, my email, brett at ruc.org.za. Email me, I'll reply. Email me and let's talk about what Jesus has done for you. Let's answer those questions. Now, church, if you're watching this and you can answer, yes, amen, I believe in the Son of Man, praise Jesus. Awesome. I'm so glad you're there with me. Then I want to remind you that one of the greatest truths when we believe in this is that Jesus died so that he might have a personal relationship with you, both on earth and in in heaven. So sometimes we get a bit confused. We think we pray a prayer, we say a thing, and we're done. We're waiting to die now and go to heaven. And while that's part of the parcel of being a Christian, yes, we will one day step into eternity and worship God forever where there's, where there's no tears, no pain, no suffering. And I, I'm so excited for that day. That's part of it. You see, Jesus did not save us only for the destination of heaven. He saved us for so much more. Heaven is the destination, but you know what? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The destination is here. Jesus ushered in the fifth greatest kingdom, his kingdom, and that kingdom of heaven is here. In fact, Jesus taught the most about the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, same thing. That was the topic he spoke the most about when he was here on earth for his ministry. The kingdom of God is here, and Jesus said that, and he taught that throughout the New Testament. You see, when you put your faith in Jesus, you were given the Spirit of God. I mentioned earlier the Holy of Holies. In the Old Testament days, the Spirit of God dwelt in the Holy of Holies, and only one person, the high priest, could enter the Holy of Holies. It was the holiest place, the Spirit of God in the center of the temple. But that all changed with Jesus. Because of his work on the cross, because of his life, death, and resurrection, we have been given his Spirit. Pentecost, we celebrate that every year. Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit into anyone who would call on the name of Jesus. And so the Holy, the Spirit of God no longer dwells in, a, in one single place. The Spirit of God dwells in you. You are now the Holy of Holies. And so wherever we go, we take God with us. Wherever God sends us, we go by His Spirit and in His Spirit. We have been saved for so much more than just heaven. We have been saved to be the workers of Jesus Christ. The kingdom of God is at hand and we have the honor and glory to be directed by the king of this kingdom, to invite more people into this kingdom, to let them know that Jesus, the son of man, came from heaven to earth on clouds so that they might know him. I love how the video, the, the, video, the prayer video we played a little bit earlier in the service it, it says this. I'm going to quote it for us. The prayer video ends like this. Work in us, work through us, so all may find redemption, so all may know salvation, this new year and every year, forever. Amen. Church family, let that be our prayer for 2021, for every year and forever. Amen. Let our prayer be, Jesus, work inside of us, carry us forward. Let us take your spirit and invite people into this glorious kingdom that you instituted, that Daniel saw all those centuries ago, that Daniel saw. Let us not waste that. Let us be a part of something so much greater than ourselves. And let's bring people into a knowing and loving relationship with Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, who sits at the right hand of the Ancient of Days. So let's hope for a better 2021. I was watching a movie yesterday, actually. Uh, it was, it's a parody. Um, and it said, 2020, the year so bad they named it twice. <laughs> I really am so glad that 2020 is behind us, church. And I really do hope, I hope, and I know that 2021 will be better than 2020. Because like I said, as a society, we get better each year. 
but that's not why I'm hoping that 2021 will be a better year than this past year. I know this year will be better than the last year because my hope is in something greater than myself. My hope is in something greater than the world around me. My hope is in Jesus Christ. And I want to invite you to put your hope in Jesus as well. If you put your hope in Jesus, I can guarantee you each year will be greater than the last because you are part of something so much greater than yourself. Church, I'm going to close for us in prayer in just a minute. But if you, like I said, if you're sitting there and thinking, I don't know what it means to have a relationship with God. I don't know what it means to to put my hope in God. These are all very Christian words that I'm saying. If you're not sure where you stand on any of this, I want to invite you again, reach out to us. On the stream, you can make a comment. Uh, if you're watching this after the stream, uh, social media, you can DM us. You can email me, like I said, brett at ruc.org.za. I'd love to talk to you. And church family, let this year be the year that we go out with the kingdom of God in hand and invite people into that kingdom. 2021 will be better than 2020 because Jesus Christ is in control. Have hope, church, and happy new year. Let's pray. I thank you, God, that wherever we look, be it last year, be it 2021, be it backward or forward, I thank you, God, that you are there. Jesus Christ, you are in control. And I thank you that we don't need to, we don't need to hold tightly to the things that we can't control. We don't have to hold tightly to the fact that the vaccine might come later than we expected. We don't have to hold tightly to the, the fear that um, numbers are increasing every day. What we need to do, Lord, is sit at your feet and pray and trust that you will bind up the brokenhearted. You will bring healing. And so I'll ask you, God, that for 2021, for 2021, may we be a church that hopes in the creator of the universe. May we be a church that is so in love with you, so on fire, so on mission for what you are uh, for, Jesus. May we be a church that goes forth with your kingdom in hand, inviting people in. May that be the thing that is on the tip of our toes, on the tip of our tongues. Please, Jesus, power us through your spirit. Send us out by your word and let us keep going. I thank you, God, that you are in control. I thank you, Jesus, we can hope in you. And I thank you, Jesus, personally, that you know me, that you changed my life, that you, Jesus, for little old me, would die on a cross and defeat death, also that I might be a part of your kingdom. I pray, God, that more people would come to know this. Pray this in your name, Lord. Amen.